southwest of the Atlantic, there is a sea within the ocean. It's a deep, salty, silent place. Great clumps of sargassum seaweed hang in the clear waters. This is the birthplace of the eel. And yet, rather wonderfully, no human has ever seen an eel here. Not dead, not alive, let alone in the act of mating. Seems like they value their privacy. And yet, it must be going on somewhere, down in the depths. Because every spring, millions of eel larvae float up towards the surface. Leptocephali, literally the thin heads. And they're tiny, just a few millimetres long, as thin as thread, translucent, except for two tiny black eyes. And these minute jaws that feast on the algae blooming in the water. They're so small, they're helpless, caught on the drift and the movement of the waves. And the ocean currents take them first west, and then north, carried on the great Gulf Stream. And along the way, they begin to separate. There are some that are indistinguishable from the others to the naked eye. And yet, if you look really closely, they have just a slightly shorter backbone. And these, well, they somehow know to, to peel off to the coasts of America. But as for the rest, they have further to go, moving with the ocean on the North Atlantic drift, further north and into the east. In the second year of their life, there are some transatlantic offspring with uh, an American father and a European mother, and these few, they tend to wash up in Iceland. But the rest, have an even longer journey to make into the third summer of their lives. The little glass eels, still translucent, but a bit bigger now, and very definitely eel-shaped. They are wriggling at the mouths of rivers all across Europe. They're here, at the mouth of the River X, and as they come upstream, they change, they darken, they become the Elvers. Once upon a time, the Elver stream, it was so thick, like a, like a dark convoy going against the flow of the river, carried upstream on the flood tides, scrambling up the steep bits, using the bodies of those that hadn't made it as a, as a ladder to the top. And of course, there were predators waiting for them the heron, the otter, even the adult eel known to feast upon the children of its own race. And naturally, naturally, we humans stood there too, scooping them out of the river to toss them into a sizzling pan of bacon fat or, or maybe slop them into a pint of cider and drink them down whole. These days, they'd be more likely to be shipped abroad to fetch dizzying prices in the far east. But the elvers that eluded capture, well, they're changing. The androgynous elver taking on a very definite gender. The females growing a little larger, a little more inclined to travel further. Because it seems that eels have a real range in their appetite for adventure. Some of them, they just don't go far, they, they linger in the estuaries. But others press on right into the, the tiniest tributaries of the river they find themselves in. 
for some, for some even this is not enough, and under cover of darkness they will take to the land, wriggling through the wet grass for miles, looking for that perfect ditch or a delicious pond to call their home. And we, or well, we have learned to catch the adult eel in a bewildering variety of ways. Some have used spillers, long fishing lines with hooks and sinkers. Others prefer nets, a hand net maybe, or an ingenious fike net. Uh, a series of funnels designed to mislead the eel until they become so narrow it cannot escape. Some have poisoned the water with berries and the eels float up to the surface. Others prefer to pick them off individually with an eel spear, calling it a pritch, or a dilja, or a stang, or a glaive, or a shear. Others have rather laboriously assembled balls of wool, baited them with rotten fish, and this, well, they've called it clotting or dotting. They've called it nairing or snigging. They've called it bobbing, broggling, rayballing, patting or tapping. In Ireland, these constructions of stakes and wickerwork have been unearthed from fossilised algae and found to be at least 3,000 years old, and yet they show the very same construction still in use on the River Ban at the end of the 20th century. Closer to home, on the River Severn, there's a rather unique practice where people use a mud horse. The fisher lies on the mud horse, rather like a toboggan, skating it across the slime to pluck the eels from the fixed nets they've set the night before. And for generations, millers have supplemented their income by very occasionally draining their mill ponds and harvesting the wriggling mass of eels. And once you've caught your eel, well, you might pin it to the wall with a knife, still wriggling. You might strip off its skin with your bare hands, or maybe a pair of pliers. You might cut it into rounds, and, and then the eel flesh. It could be fried, it could be stewed, it could be jellied, it could be pressed into cheese, it could be made into a minced eel pie. Eely pie. Ely pie, a penny a pocket full, buy, buy, buy. They catch them in buckets, they catch them in nets, they catch them in fistfuls and fill up their hats. Ely pie, ely pie, a penny a pocket full, buy, buy, buy. Or, if you are a slightly more refined kabayaki connoisseur, you take your eel, you gut it, you bone it, you splay it, you blanch it, you steam it. You grill it three times with a dipping of soy sauce in between each one and mmm, this delicacy. Thousands of tons of it is consumed every year in Japan. And that's not all you can do with an eel. The fat of the eel was once used to light the lamps. The skin of the eel Oh, don't throw that away. You could make yourself a pair of braces, or a, a hairband, perhaps, or, or maybe a garter to uh, ward off the sickness. You could make it into a door hinge. You could make it into a filter, or a lash to castigate your naughty children. Or even, even, a very well-lubricated condom. With such versatile value, it's no wonder the eel has become a currency at some points. In medieval times, eels could be paid in rent. The abbot of Ely, it said, once collected over 100,000 eels. Don't ask me what on earth he did with them. In the 17th century, eels were passing through this custom house on Exeter Quayside, charged, according to the tariff board in the next room, at two pence a barrel. These days, there's a modern black market, fed by the insatiable demand from the East and the growing scarcity of supply. 
a kilogram of eels might fetch up to £6,000. But those eels, those cunning eels that somehow managed to avoid all this capture, well, at some point in their lives, maybe 10 years after they found their freshwater home, maybe 20 years, in some cases, as much as 50 years later, each individual eel, it feels a call, a pull, an urge to travel back downstream on a mission to procreate. And nothing's going to stop them. Here they come, undulating through the wet grass under cover of darkness. Here they come, swimming downstream with a, a following wind and the waning moon, seeking freedom out in the ocean. And here, well, here they travel in the depths by day, rising to the shallower, warmer waters by night. And how do they find their way? Do they have some dim memory of their time as a thin head in the ocean? Do they maybe follow the Earth's magnetic fields? Are they maybe guided by the different smells of the different parts of the ocean? We don't really know. And there are an extraordinary variety of routes that take the eels across the ocean, but they, they do seem to gather west of Portugal in the Azores. And then, well then they disappear from human view. Only some of them at least must make it back to the Sargasso Sea. And there, Millions of eggs, billions of milk, mingle as they mate, and this last glorious act complete, they die and fall away to decay and be scavenged on the seabed miles below. Meanwhile, up floats the new crop of eel larvae. The leptocephali floating up towards the light. for many, many years. They feature in Pacific Aboriginal, in ancient Egyptian mythology. They crop up in the Bible, in the Iliad, in Shakespeare. The people who once lived around the, the great Lake Capias in ancient Greece, they were said to worship the eel, putting tiny golden crowns upon their heads. There they are wriggling across the bottom of the Bayer tapestry. And here they are, writhing in the ceiling of the plaster work overhead designed by John Abbott in the 17th century. The eel, it's given its name to a cathedral city in England, to a Japanese film that won the Palme d'Or in 1997. But really, human culture, ha, we're just a blip on the eel's timeline. They've been going strong for millions of years. Long ago, when the continents weren't the shape we know them now, there was an ancient, primeval, Tethys ocean, landlocked on three sides. And this was the original spawning ground of all the world's eels. And as time passed and the continents moved and drifted, new sea corridors opened up, the eels separated, some to the west, to the Sargasso Sea, others to the east, into the Pacific. And from here, they spread successfully all around the world. 
since we turned up, we humans, while we've been doing our usual unwitting best to get rid of them. Overfishing, pollution, man-made barriers on the rivers, even diseases emerging among the captive populations and then released back into the wild. We've even been doing our godlike best to alter the climate and weaken the Gulf Stream they depend upon. The eels are in crisis. And maybe, maybe we can do something to help them. And there are those working locally here on the River X trying to do just that. But maybe, maybe in any case, a few patient, stubborn creatures, they will wait out the human experiment biding their time in some forgotten ditch while the world as we wanted it, as we intended it, goes up in flames. Until it's safe, safe for them to re-emerge, to spawn and flourish without us once more.